Hey, what's up? What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of The Periodic Table. I am, of course, your host, Brandon Hanna. You might know me. I'm a mechanical engineer. You might have seen me hosting a couple shows over at AfterBuzz TV, the Popcorn Talk Network, or uh, the Movie Trivia Showdown. And, um, well, this is the weekly science news show that we do over here on my YouTube channel. We just talk about the hottest science news stories of the week. And I think we got some fun ones for you all today. But before we get into all that, I do have an amazing panel of hosts with me uh, to my left, your right. You might know her from the movie trivia Shmodown as well. She is the inner geekdom champion of the world. And she's also a nuclear reactor operator slash nuclear operations instructor. She knows a lot about fission and we might be getting into that today. It's Mara Kanopic. Hello, hello, internet. How's it going? I think I think they're saying it's going great. It's going great. It's great. Well, it's great to have you here. So it's going to be it's always a great show having you on. So welcome. thank you for coming back. Oh, thank you for having me. It's always nice to talk about atoms. Yes, <laughs> well, we're going to get into that for sure. But before we do, uh, you've seen him, him on this show many times. He's a TV host, actor and comedian. And you might also know him from After Buzz TV or Black Hollywood Live, both in front of the camera and writing articles. It is James Maple. Hey, 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 party people. Happy Friday. Excited to talk about science today, for sure. Yes, uh, super excited to have you back as well, James. Thanks, it's sir. always great to have you on the show. I know it's been it's been a, it's been a it's been a while to have both of you. So it's great to have you both together. Should yeah. be a lot of fun. Um, we do have an amazing show for you all today. Uh, our, our number one story is DNA can be collected from air. Um, scientists are showing this for the first time. Uh, that's going to be a really fascinating one to get into. I think we also have the science and technology that can help save the ocean. Um, very uh, topical, very important uh, for us to get into that one. And also a third story today before we get into our special segment, because how could I not talk about this having James and Mara on the show? We have uranium snowflakes could set off thermonuclear explosions of dead stars. That is fascinating. And of course, we do have a special segment uh, bringing back Let's Get Social, talking about the viral TikTok that explains vaccine science. It can make you laugh. It can teach you a little bit about how vaccines work. And well, that's kind of like what this show is all about, learning a little bit about science and having fun along the way. But before we get into that, let's jump up to our number one story for this week. And it is DNA can be collected from the air. So apparently this technique uh, could be used in conservation work, forensic investigations, and even to study the transmission of airborne diseases such as COVID-19. So scientists at Queen Mary University of London have shown for the first time ever that DNA can be collected from the air. And like I said, the finding could provide new techniques for forensic researchers, anthropologists, and even help understanding uh, airborne diseases and the, the, the team looked into whether environmental DNA could be collected from air samples and used to identify animal species. And turns out uh, you can. Uh, most similar studies to date have focused on the collection of DNA, which they call eDNA for environmental DNA. They've collected it from water, but this is the first time they're doing it from air. And I think this is really fascinating and could have uh, a lot of potential future implications for many different fields of work and fields of study, like like I mentioned. Uh, but before we get into it any deeper, Mara, let's go over to you first. What were your overall thoughts on this article? Um, are you optimistic about the, the possibilities of collecting DNA from air? Do you think this is a, a good, uh, good thing? Well, I have to say first, I went through a flurry of emotions reading this article because I was fascinated. So I was feeling a lot of curiosity. I was feeling happiness about learning something new. And then I saw that picture of the naked mole rat and I immediately <laughs> felt so much disgust and fear. I couldn't eat anything the rest of the day. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> But no, truly though, especially now with how topical airborne disease is, uh, of course that's fascinating, but I am obsessed with true crimes. So naturally my brain first went to, okay, so now if someone plans a murder, they need to wear an N95, that's what we're learning. Um, do you remember that old Ryan Gosling movie, Murder by Numbers? I wonder, I can't remember if he and Michael Pitt wore N95s, but now I feel like I have to go back and check. So, I mean, for furthering our understanding uh, and epidemiologists studies, I think that that's interesting, but also for uh, crime scene analysis and, you know, murder and stuff. That's also very interesting. 
Yeah, I think so for sure. And like you said, it was kind of their proof of concept to see if they can collect the DNA from a naked mole rat that was floating around in the air. And like, and and it turns out that you can, and that's pretty mind blowing to me. James, let's go over to you next. Were you uh, just as enthralled by this article as we were? Was there any specific part of it that stood out to you as like the most important takeaway? I agree with both of you. Uh, to be honest, uh, the, the my kind of thought process process was similar to Mars, and that I kind of went to the whole crime scene investigation too. I was like, okay, well, what does that mean for criminal intent and everything like that? Um, I also thought it was pretty interesting too. I don't know, maybe I perhaps have mis misread the article, but it seemed as though the the discovery of the human DNA airborne it seemed as if it were like a mistake, and it, it just happened to find it as they were looking for the mole rat DNA. Um, but one thing that really stood out to me that I was kind of thinking about in the background as I was reading this article was, uh, remember a couple weeks ago, there was news about like a lunar arc that they were collecting DNA samples from um, Earth and like sending them to the moon. I thought that, I don't, I, obviously the cor correlation is the DNA sample itself, but you know, I never really even articulated the thought of having it be an airborne uh, DNA sample that um, we could collect. And I'll be curious to know what what new, uh, you know, ramifications could that have on that effort and with the lunar arc that they were working on as well? Yeah, definitely. So it says here in the article that this approach was initially used for ecological assessments. They wanted to use this as an opportunity to investigate like animal communities and hard to reach environments, but then later on, able to discover that, wow, this has so many different applications. Like we've already said, the, the forensics investigations of, of the use of that is probably the most interesting. I know a lot of people out there are like listening to a lot of true crime podcasts. We watch a lot of TV shows about true crime. And it's, I think, and it, it, this also has the potential to be the most, one of the most useful applications to, to catch people who commit, you know, violent crimes. I think that's, that is a really positive takeaway from this article, but also the transmission of airborne diseases is also something very uh, important and very topical today, obviously, with everything going on with COVID-19. So, um, yeah, this this one, I just I, I really thought this was fascinating. Uh, I never this was for them to do this for the first time and to kind of like almost like fall into it by accident, like like science does in many ways is like you make these discoveries when you're not expecting to. Right. So um, I think that that is really cool. And um, yeah. So, so Mara, I just want to throw it back over to you the next, before we move on to our next story, was there anything else in this article that really stood out to you um, that you thought that, that you thought maybe like, wow, this is something I never thought of before. And this is a really cool application of this science. Sort of. I mean, I, James and I have already like spitballed it far further yeah. than it has gone, but it said specifically that it identified DNA as in just by species. So I would be curious to keep following this and see if they, you know, because different types of DNA samples and quantities and complexities and whether or not it's been tainted by anything else uh, affects the ability to pare it down to like, you know, a one in X billion chance that the DNA belongs to you or someone else. So whether or not it's simply going to be effective in the current space of science, uh, is it just going to be able to say this is human DNA? Or is it going to be to say that this is Brandon Hanna's human DNA? <laughs> so I'd be curious to see how they hone this process, because I know we've talked about what it could do. But right now, it seemed like according to the article, it can only identify things by species. So uh, I would just like to keep keep our fingers on the pulse and see what happens. Yeah, definitely. This sounds like a good story to keep uh, our, keep our eye on down the road. And how dare you put me at the scene of the crime? I was never there. A, a human was there, but you'll never be able to prove that it was me. You are the hit man. <laughs> I didn't pull this out of nowhere. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, James, let, let's go over to you next. Is there any other any other takeaways that we haven't gotten into? Um, do you think that this is something that they could develop further down the road? Or do you think they'll only be able to get as far as saying, this is human DNA, this is mole rat DNA, this is cat, dog, you name it? You know, I'd like to, I'd like to think so. You know, we have certain forensic sciences, science, sciences now with, you know, fingerprints and, and, and dental impressions and, and impressions and what have you. So I'd like to hope that potentially down the line, we would be able to go, go further than, than just beyond a, a certain species, as Mara said. 
Um, it would be interesting, uh, though, to see what what that could, like I said, like we said earlier, how that could happen with um, like criminal investigations. And I'd be just curious to see the the correlation between the science and the criminality of the whole of of, of it all. Yeah, definitely. Um, really cool story, and definitely something that hopefully we can follow up on it in, in a future episode to see how far it advanced. So we will definitely want to keep our eye on that. Uh, but before we move on to our next story, I just want to thank everyone who's watching right now. I see we got a few people in the live chat. We got Aiden Kosick, BCD, and Ferris Muthana. Um, thank you so much uh, for being here, joining in on the conversation. And I know we're doing this a day earlier in the week than we normally do. So thank you for taking time to, to, to join us. Uh, please, guys, if you're watching, like the video. Leave a comment down below if you're watching after the fact and you want to leave your thoughts. I would love to reply back and get a conversation going about these great scientific topics and hit that subscribe button if you're interested in watching along with us every single week here because we do have a lot of fun talking about the, what's going on in the world of science. And speaking of which, uh, we do have an article here that I think um, could have a lot of positive uh, ramifications in the future. And that is the science and technology that can help save the ocean. So guys, apparently only 19% of the ocean is mapped uh, on the face of the earth. We, we, there's so much about the ocean that we don't know what's there. And apparently having a better understanding of the ocean floor, the ocean itself, uh, pollution and litter and fish migrations and the coral reefs and all that stuff, there is so much regarding the ocean and climate and the overall health of the planet and and obviously all the species who inhabit it so so we have and it says here in the article that here on earth we have more detailed maps of mars than we do of our own ocean to, to kind of put it into perspective and so uh james before i get any further into this because there is a lot to absorb mm -hmm. um speaking of the ocean absorbing heat <laughs> uh, but uh, which is mentioned in this article, but there's, there's a lot to break down. I want to throw it over to you first. Uh, what is your overall impression of this article? What was something that stood out to you right away about uh, maybe the importance of, of uh, understanding our oceans better and how it correlates to uh, our, our climate health and overall health as a planet? Or uh, maybe was there a certain way of the technology involved that really piqued your interest? Uh, what did you think? Well, the first thing that came to mind for sure, uh, as a kid, I remember like one of the first like scientific like aha moments that I had was was what you kind of already stated in that uh, we know more about the, you know, the surface of Mars or the moon or even outer space in general than we do about our own oceans. I remember being at like maybe 10 or 11 in science class and, and like being like, Wow, but like the ocean's right there. How do how do we not know? So I had a base uh, lust for this story and, and going into it. Um, I think one of the, the the biggest things that I in reading the article, I feel like it was broken into two sections. The first section I felt was kind of damning. It felt very like in anxiety inducing and very heavy. And then I think the second uh, part of it really showed the the scientific breakthroughs we, we've made. Um, I have to say that I I loved the connection between you know, the political struggle, the uh, the economic struggle, the ecological struggle that it mentioned, I think it mentioned about how the mapping could affect, you know, uh, a communications beacon and put into the ocean and how, we, where's the right place to put it as it could affect, you know, mussel beds or coral reefs. Those are the little things I think that many people overlook, including myself when it comes to like the ocean and, it, and its importance. Um, another takeaway I got from this article was uh, there are a few things I think on this planet that connect us all. I would say climate is one and the ocean is another. I'm sure there are many, many more. Um, I love uh, towards the end of the article where it talks about the different programs that are kind of happening underneath our nose that we don't really know about and are making like ma massive, massive strides to protect the oceans that we do have. So I thought um, that quick snippet that they that the author wrote about the different programs and the benchmarks they have for 2030 and 2040 um, were great to know that there are you know policies and, and people in place to to better the ocean for all of us moving forward. Yeah, definitely. It, it it is it is good to know that there are people like working on on this and and that care and that this article reading this article made me realize just how much of a problem it is. I mean, we've all known like about like pollution and its effect on our oceans and our overall effect on the planet. But this article 
really highlighted for me uh, just how useful it could be to have our ocean properly mapped when it comes to like overfishing and habitat destruction, as we said, like pollution, uh, but also the technology really stood out to me of like using robotics and like artificial intelligence and like decades of data all collected and like accumulated together to, 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 to map out the ocean as much as possible so that we, we know as much as possible because it is, the ocean is so vast and covers so much of the planet and it's utilizing the same technology that we already have to, to, to map the surface of other worlds but not so much our own. So Mara, I wanna throw it over to you next. Um, what was your overall impressions of this article? Did you learn anything new for the first time? Did anything really stand out to you uh, as, as super exciting or optimistic when it comes to better understanding our oceans or the technology that's involved? Well, it's interesting that you uh, picked this article because I, help Dan do some research. And he, is, I don't think it's like a huge spoiler. I think he's probably already said it. But next week's episode of his All My Movies is going to be for Titanic. So lots of special <laughs> features with James Cameron going in his DSV and exploring the ocean. And uh, the fact that you mentioned the AI specifically, that was one thing where when they were kind of discussing how it computes this data and how it works, uh, this is Skynet. I'm pretty sure <laughs> in the future, this is 100% going to be our undoing. We're going to try to save the planet, and in turn, we're going to cause our own human destruction. But mutually exclusive of that, um, I also thought that its concerns about biodiversity, which some of the most biodiverse environments are the ones that we have no idea exist in the bottom of the ocean, specifically because man can't affect them, at least not yet. So uh, the idea that this is something that we can start bringing more into the shallows. And like you mentioned, like if uh, communications cables, I think for it was uh, like a military naval application that they had specified communications uh, lines or something that it's not just simply putting them somewhere. It's where you hello, where you uh, <laughs> should put them, where you can put them, because all of that stuff, even just something as simple as a cable can affect the biodiversity of an environment, which is so incredibly important. Um, so yeah, I, I thought that that was a really specific point that they didn't draw on it too, too much, but that's something I'm really interested in. So yeah, definitely. And I, I hope I hope we don't have a Skynet situation on our hands. I know uh, we, we had uh, Ben Goddard on the show a, a few weeks ago, and he was very skeptical wearing his tinfoil hat. So I think he would be in much agreement with you about uh, the worries there. But uh, for the time being, I see this as a very, a very positive thing. You know, I like, you know, James mentioned, like, they have like a timeline, like they're uh, of, of, of how they're trying to accomplish a certain set of goals. You know, we have here that the United Nations has declared 2021 through 2030, the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And they they say it's like the Paris Climate Accord for the ocean. So I think that is a really great thing for, you know, the United Nations to kind of come together because, I mean, the ocean is, you know, as big as the whole world. Right. So it, it makes a lot of sense. And, you know, immediately right off the bat, I see this article and I'm like, wow, that is like, it's really cool that they are working on mapping the oceans and the technology involved is really interesting. But then what do you do when you have all of this data? And the article does like kind of get into it. It kind of can like dictate where like offshore wind turbines are like most optimally locate, located, like where will they have the least impact on like commercial fishing and like ocean life. And I know you know, from my own studies when I was in school, um, underwater cables, uh, you know, emit electromagnetic waves that could damage ocean life. They could change fish migrations and affect the coral reefs and all that stuff. So there's a lot to consider there about where you lay these cables and the EMI uh, that emitted out of it. So um, and, and 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 so on. There's there's just a lot to a lot to kind of like take in and digest in this article. Um, I think it, it's really fascinating and there's just like so many like avenues and different fields of technology and science involved, all kind of working towards a common goal, which I, I think is great. And it, I think it really kind of like shows to what we can kind of do as a society when we kind of come together and connect all of our different, uh, all of our different backgrounds. And, and so it's, I, th I think this is really this is really cool. So that would kind of be like my main takeaway is just um, like, like a, like 
that the United Nations and everyone's kind of coming together to do this, but also be like learning about, okay, this is really great once we have this data, but like, what can we do afterwards once we have this data to actually uh, create positive change in the ocean and in the world? Um, so uh, James, let me throw it right back to yeah. you. Is there, is there any other uh, closing thoughts on this article? Any other takeaways that maybe we didn't get into in our discussion so far? You know, the only one, it's very, very small thing. Um, the, it was in the article, they were talking about the output data of uh, GIS and they said the output data they use what was a similar um, method they used to track COVID-19 cases. I thought that was a pretty interesting, it, in, the, the, in the article, it was very short, maybe a sentence or two long. I would be interested to see the connection between the mapping, like exactly how the mapping of our oceans and the mapping of COVID-19 have a, have a correlation. So to go, to, to, to go back to your point, Brandon, um, it's just so interesting to see how something, you know, we're tracking the, the, the topography of the oceans, essentially, and we're applying that to, um, you know, tracking a, 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 a novel virus. So um, I thought that was a pretty interesting thing, and it's definitely something I didn't expect to learn in reading the article. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that that is really fascinating if there is like, you know, some sort of correlation between the type of data of like, you know, something else mapping COVID-19 cases and being able to like map the ocean and other things and how it all kind of like integrates together. I think that that is that is really fascinating and something to look into for sure. Um, and, and so Mara, I want to throw it over to you uh, one more time. Uh, it says here that their goal is to map the entire ocean floor by the year 2030. Do you think that is a, a realistic goal? Do you think that is fast enough to implement the positive change that we need uh, going forward? Because obviously climate change is a very real threat and there's so many other different, um, uh, you know, horrible things that the humans do to the environment. Do you think a 2030 goal of mapping the ocean floor is, is realistic, helpful, beneficial? And did you have any more, uh, any, any, anything else about the article that you wanted to speak on that maybe we hadn't touched on yet? I mean, I think that unfortunately, some of it does come down to funding, which can ultimately boil down to politics, not just here in the United States, but globally, too. Um, we're not the only place that has differences of opinion regarding climate change. Uh, I think that the, I mean, scientists have said that it is our lifetime where we are going to decide whether or not we're going to save the future of the planet. So, yeah, I think that having that information at our hands is going to be incredibly important. But uh, channeling this into my micro public service announcement, we, us individual people, we can affect incredible change. So, for example, I, I drink a lot of beverages, but you know what? I use titanium straws with my with my cups. I don't use any plastic straws anymore. Um, I don't recommend the glass ones because I'm so terrified of them breaking. But um, I agree. I agree with really, that more. Really cute, super trendy. This is titanium. Um, I can throw it in my dishwasher. I don't have to use that little thingy and clean it out myself. So um, I would really encourage everyone to try to minimize their own use of disposable plastic items. I keep a little container with a fork, a spoon and chopsticks uh, with me in the car and in my bag. So that way, if I was going to get like takeaway from somewhere and they were going to give me a single use plastic spork or something, I can decline it and say no, thank you. Um, I use, you know, recycled uh, hand towels for when I do use a paper towel. If not, I always use hand towels, just little, simple, tiny microscopic things that we all do as individual people when there's over 7 billion of us on the planet can affect enormous change. So PSA over, but please take that into consideration, folks. No, that's very well said. We actually just got some metal straws of our own in the house. So uh, we're, we're, we're right there with you. I'm trying to cut down my paper towel use. I use too much. I get yelled at sometimes, but it's okay. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Um, and I see we also uh, got, you know, Christina Vasallo in the chat who was, uh, who was on the show last week and uh, Sabrina Ramirez, of course, as always, and Raul uh, Alejandro Mendoza, who you've seen on the channel here before. Welcome. Thank you guys uh, for joining in. It's time to move on to our uh, next story, which I think is one that James and Mara are excited to get into. And so let's just jump right into it. Uranium snowflakes, snowflakes in parentheses it has here, uh, could set off a thermonuclear explosions of dead stars. So uh, white dwarf stars could go supernova in response to nuclear fission caused by uranium crystals. So we have tiny crystals of uranium that can set off these explosions within a dead star that and physicists are proposing this 
Um, and it, they, they call it a cosmic version of a thermonuclear bomb. So expired stars called white dwarfs slowly cool as they age. Uh, and in the process, heavy elements such as uranium begin to crystallize, forming snowflakes in stars' cores. And if enough uranium clumps together, uh, which they say is about the mass of a grain of sand, it could initiate a chain of, thermo of, of nuclear fission reactions uh, or the splitting of atomic nuclei. Um, so I think this is, this is a really cool article. It's a short article, but I think there are some really cool takes away. And I know we're all kind of space geeks on this show here today. And I know, Mara, uh, you are a huge fan of uh, nuclear fission and fusion and uh, different types of dwarf stars, if you will. So I want to throw it over uh, to you first. Uh, what was your overall thoughts on this article? Did you potentially learn something new uh, reading this article that you, maybe you didn't know before? Or was there just anything in general that piqued your interest? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, as far as the application of, of nuclear power, we really only studied terrestrial uses of uranium. <laughs> so um, I was really fascinated by that concept, especially because, I mean, the idea that when they mentioned the mass of a grain of sand, that makes me think that this must be of incredibly high enrichment, mm -hmm. which is really fascinating because, you know, we have to, um, like, use centrifuges to enrich uranium here, and different enrichments can uh, apply to different things like just regular nuclear power generation or naval nuclear power, which is far more enriched or weapons grade. So uh, I was really interested in the idea that uh, without them defining it, my intuition and my studies say that that would probably be very high enrichment. So part of me says, why don't we just go get some of this stuff from space? That could, <laughs> that could happen. Um, in my in my uh, head canon, that's where we go scientifically is we just start getting uranium from space. But uh, I like the idea that they're saying that they can now, they're theorizing that uh, where normally this would have to have an interaction with a planet that, ooh, sorry, I scared the cat, um, <laughs> that this can now these type, I think it was a 1A supernova or something, that it can happen without that. So they're completely reformulating their theory on how this, like what is the inciting incident for this to occur. So the idea that we're even now still with, as much as we know about space compared to the ocean, as we just learned, uh, that we're still finding out and, and reshaping our ideas of how things happen in space. Yeah, uh, definitely. I, I think it's really a fascinating like, kind of application of all this stuff that we really only, only understand like in terms of like a hands-on experience here on Earth. Um, what was the biggest takeaway for me was there was uh, one sentence, uh, a, a paraphrase um, from Matt Kaplan of Illinois State University. Um, he said that the effect is akin to a hydrogen bomb a, thermo, a powerful thermonuclear weapon in which fission reaction triggers fusion. That was really crazy to me because I, I don't know too much about nuclear power and fission and fusion, but um, the idea of a fission reaction triggering fusion, that was something that I was not familiar with until reading this article. Um, so that, that immediately caught my attention and makes me want to learn more. So uh, James, I want to throw it over to you next. Was there anything like that that you saw in this article that made you want to kind of jump down a rabbit hole of nuclear fusion and fission and, and, and really kind of like pique your interest and make you learn something new about space that maybe you didn't know before? I think you two touched on, uh, you know, my main points. Um, I, I don't know if, if a thing called cosmic anxiety exists, but <laughs> after reading this article, I definitely have it for our listeners. I just want to read the opening sentence to this article and you'll understand what I mean. It said tiny crystals of uranium could set off massive explosions within a dead star, a dead star, excuse me, physicists say, making for a cosmic version of a nuclear bomb. Like that's the opening sentence to this article. And I, I feel like it added to my like cosmic anxiety. I feel like I have a lot of like irrational fears, one of which is like driving behind a truck with uh, logs on it after watching Final Destination. <laughs> We'll never do that. So I feel like this was an added, uh, this is a new addition to my to my like daily irrational anxieties. Um, overall though, I thought it was super interesting. Um, I, I'm not the uh, uh, expert on fusion or fission, nor on space, just just have a deep interest for it. So this was something that I didn't I didn't know. Um, I kind of knew the, the rough elements of the story itself. Um, but like Mara said, it's just always interesting how, you know, space science is, is ever changing. And though this is just a theory, you know, many things that we thought were theories have, have been proven to be fact. So um, I hope 
one day we get to see something like this happen very, 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 very far away. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I thought this was a super interesting article and I love, like Brandon, I think this is a great choice having Amara and myself on <laughs> in the topic of the article itself. So, and also the name of the article itself is called Uranium Snowflakes. I just thought that was so catchy and funny. That's such a good band name. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, we're all going to pick up some instruments and that's going to be our band name uh, going forward. Uh, yeah, no, I really thought, you know, having both of you on, this was a great article. So it's kind of why I tacked it on as like one extra uh, additional article for this week. Um, this is, And this is, I think it's just something just really uh, interesting because it kind of like helps us like learn more about space and like stars in general, because it kind of says here in the closing paragraph that, we, we know that white white dwarf uh, stars are explosion prone and they're the source of a blast called a type 1A supernova. And that normally to up until recently, to, to our knowledge, these explosions only happen when a white dwarf pulls matter off of a companion star. But now th with this discovery, they're realizing that actually a small fraction of these 1A supernovas uh, could happen without the need for another star. It could happen internally from these snowflakes, if you will. So even though it doesn't affect my day-to-day -day life here on Earth, I think this is a really, a really, a really fascinating discovery. And and like I said, it, it immediately piqued my interest to learn more about fission and fusion. And two things that I initially thought were like kind of like two sides of the same nuclear coin can sometimes go hand in hand. Uh, so, so, so Mara, I do want to throw it over to you one more time before uh, we get moving on to our special segment. Was there anything else that you wanted to address with this article or nuclear fission uh, as a whole? Yes, um, I, I would really be curious to know. Um, I almost got a job working at Los Alamos, um, but they okay. called me for an interview after I'd already accepted another job. So I had to <laughs> decline no matter how much I really wanted to work there. But I would be really curious to know how this sort of information is affecting uh, research because I mean, my dream was always to just do research rather than just like split atoms all day long to make somebody <laughs> power for their blender. But um, <laughs> you know, it, whatever happens, happens. But um, for people that are um, less familiar with fission, because it's not something that's really focused on much in like uh, secondary school or university level curriculum, unless you are focusing on an engineering science. Um, there's a really fantastic uh, YouTube video. It's like a million years old, but it's on YouTube. Imagine a room full of mouse traps with little ping pong balls on them. Fission is such an amazing, fantastic sort of thing that happens. And it just requires a, a tipping point. And I mean, bear in mind, we're talking like subatomic sort of stuff. So, but take one little ping pong ball. And what if I gave it to James? And I said, James, throw that ping pong ball over to those mouse traps. Well, it's going to hit at least one of them. And then it's going to go off. And mm -hmm. it's probably going to set off like three or four or five, which is going to set off 25 or 50 or 100. That is what fission is. So if you ever want to learn a little bit more at just a basic rudimentary level, go check out um, the mousetrap fission explanation because it's really fun to watch because they actually do it. Yeah, that, that, that sounds great. Actually, you actually just reminded me of like a meme that I saw uh, the other day because I follow like these like engineering meme groups on Facebook and one of them was like it was like a scientist like explaining like how amazing and powerful nuclear fission can be and then the engineer is just like all right well I'm gonna take this I'm gonna heat up water the steam the steam's gonna make this turbine spin and then we're gonna we're gonna have power from that and then the scientist is just like well what about all this other stuff it's like nah steam make turbine go <laughs> it's true really like it all boils down to um you know creating uh like current carrying conductor in a magnetic field something spinning to make something else move to generate power or yeah. like mechanical agitation for like a propeller or something so it's just it's really simple when you look at it <laughs> yeah definitely simple but really fascinating when you kind of like get into the the nuts and bolts of it all so uh, it's really cool and i uh, thank you for sharing your expertise on the subject it's always great uh Always great to have that. So um, let's move on to our special segment uh, for the week. Let me pull it up here, guys. So we have uh, Let's Get Social. We're talking about a viral TikTok that explains vaccine science. Um, so we have this, this, this really good article here um, about a TikTok. Uh, I'm trying to, to sift through my notes here. Uh, Vic Krishna is the name of the TikToker. If you want to go and, and follow him right now, um, 
So he has this amazing TikTok where he explains that the, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines work um, and, and kind of like with the, with the goal of taking a complex scientific topic and like simplifying it and making it fun and easy to digest, which is what we kind of like try to do on this show. Um, but, uh, and not, not, not so much, but you know, the, art, the article says here, it's, it's a super fun watch. It's a horror film parody, which immediately catches my interest, including a monster with spiky fork hands, people disappearing into thin air, a concerned scientist. And, uh, it's, 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 and it's, it, but it is a, it's a family friendly, uh, video. So, um, this could be a great thing to, sh to show kids to kind of explain to them how these vaccines work, because there is a lot of uncertainty out there. A lot of people, as we talked about on the show, people uh, who there's, there's, there's a fear about obviously vaccines. Um, and, and, you know, it's important once people, I think for people to understand how these vaccines work and why they work, I think it, it, it helps put people's mind at ease and encourages more people to get vaccinated, which is what we all want, because obviously we want the world to be a safer, healthier place and kind of go back to a little bit uh, more sense of normalcy. Uh, so James, uh, I want to throw it over to you. Did you have the opportunity to watch this TikTok? Uh, what did you think? And in general, um, do you think that this is a great way uh, going forward to kind of educate people about scientific topics that might seem scary and complicated and simplify them and make them fun and easy to digest. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think, to be completely frank, I think Mara's previous example is a, is a perfect example of that, you know, the, the, the mousetrap uh, mm -hmm. explaining fission. Um, I think, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, what's his, the YouTuber's name again? Oh. Krishna. Yeah, uh, so sure. yeah, I uh, I uh, I watched the video. I didn't have a great understanding of how the vaccine worked, so I ended up watching the video once. Then I watched and I read a blurb about how the vaccine works, and then I went back and watched it again, and it became funnier because I had a base understanding of you know what the m I think is uh, the mRNA uh, does proteins do. So I thought uh, I think this approach is, is 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 genius. I think it's something that you know. Like you mentioned earlier, Brandon, that we we try to do weekly and try to you know dilute the topics a little bit to make them more approachable, and so all of us can learn and, and, and throw in our expertise um, on on different topics. Um, he has a he has a great following too on TikTok. I watched a couple of his videos. Many of them are well over a million a million likes and views. So shout out to him. Um, I thought this was hilarious. I thought it was effective, and I have I indeed his his his, his uh. His, his plot worked because I have a great understanding of the vaccine now and and and, and looking forward to getting it myself. Yeah, awesome. And, and you know, like you said, like it is great when people kind of like come together and share their expertise and their their knowledge. And, you know, it says here that Krishna works at NPR as a development and operations engineer in New York City. So he's clearly someone who has a background in obviously public radio, like being able to uh, express yourself and like talk about uh, something that could be complicated or maybe see mundane and, and try to make it digestible to like the everyday like listener or like people are just like watching TikToks at home now. So it's really it's really great to see Mara. Let's let's throw it over to you now. Uh, what were your overall thoughts on this? Did, did you have time to watch the TikTok? Did you enjoy it? Uh, did you maybe learn something that you didn't already know uh, about how these vaccines work? Or if you already did, did know how these vaccines work, do you think that this is something that is easily digestible uh, to someone who's going in there not knowing uh, immediately how these the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines like help you, you know, build up an immunity to the virus? I would like to thank Brandon Hanna for officially ruining my life because I finally had to download TikTok. Ah. Um, <laughs> I can watch it. But yes, yes, I did. And I, uh, I was lucky enough that um, when I was in school that I took um, some epidemiology electives because I'm a dork and I take science electives because, you know, why, why take art um, when you can just <laughs> learn about germs? So um, I, I fortunately did uh, as I followed the course of the pandemic, which uh, Sam Levine is also another person who is incredibly well versed um, as a, you know, we're relative layman compared to someone who's actually gotten their degree in epidemiological research, etc. But um, that have had a lot of fun uh, conversations because we follow the science and understand it pretty well for, you know, again, layman. But I think that this sort of thing, th this is one of the things that social media, I think, that's the positive of it because there's a whole lot of negatives. But um, I mean, science is 
the study of objective fact and we interpret it and we have opinions on it and how it should be used and whether or not someone should or shouldn't do something. And I think that the biggest thing is arming yourself with information because um, obviously I have my opinion on vaccination and it's because I have the information to decide for myself and so does everyone else. But I think that there is a lot of disinformation out there on a lot of different subjects, not just vaccines, but and not even just climate change, but the the fact that this is something that is designed to help arm yourself with information, even in its most basic sense, to understand what mRNA does and doesn't do, what proteins do and don't do, and whether or not this is something that, based on your medical provider's guidance, is or is not going to be something that is the right decision for you medically. Um, I, I think that this is exactly the kind of stuff that people need to do. Uh, this is what TikTok should do. TikTok should just teach us about things that we may not fully grasp or understand. So um, I know that I was also very uh, pleased to see that uh, they're opening up more vaccinations in 16 plus across the country. So if it is something that you're interested in, please just do your research. And I've been uh, vaccinated. So is Dan Merle. So is Dan Merle's mom. So, uh, I, and I'm still here. So just saying. Yeah, no, that was that was very well well said and well put. Like, you know, like obviously like it, it is important to decide, you know, obviously like I encourage, you know, everyone uh who who can get a vaccine and can do it, you know, with their, you know, like like you said, like talk to your like, you know, like a healthcare, you know, like you know, your your physician, like, you know, because obviously like different people have different like different like health issues and stuff and like some people are able to take vaccines, some people aren't, and it all kind of depends on like where you at, where you're not where you at. <laughs> it depends on where you're at. You're not wrong. You're not wrong. Uh, it also depends on where you're at because you know some states you know have different uh, you know eligibility requirements than others. So you know make sure you check in with that. If you are someone who does want to get the vaccine and you're eager, maybe you are eligible right now and you don't know it. So you know uh, I'm I'm still working uh, trying to, to schedule myself an appointment uh, to get to get a vaccine. But it is it is an important issue. It's very topical. I mean I mean you hear it in the news every day. Uh, you know, about, you know, vaccines and at what stage in, you know, eligibility and availability they're, they're, they're out there. So, and how effective they're proven to be for like different age groups and people uh, in different, like, you know, health statuses, if you will. So it is, it is important. And I think it is, uh, it's always great to see uh, someone go out there and kind of like take it upon themselves to be an educator and like, and, and and kind of ease some fear amongst people who uh, maybe just not that they're not like educated on the topic, but it is a complicated issue and they haven't kind of like found um, something that explained it well enough to them. So if someone could go out there and make TikToks, which you see like everyone is on TikTok these days, you know, so they just kind of like, stumble, yeah, <laughs> to just stumble across a video like that, you know, it could it could be the difference between whether or not someone decides to go and get a vaccine because it could answer some some questions so i think it's great uh if you guys do have don't necessarily download tiktok uh to watch this unless you, i appreciate you doing that mara uh but if you already have tiktok you know go go check out uh go check out this video and, and other videos um uh apparently he's a very popular uh tiktoker as, as james said so um yeah so i think uh that just about wraps up our show for today uh we covered a wide variety of topics again please oh yes of course go right ahead so this might actually help you out brandon now i don't know exactly what areas this is uh implemented in but it's worth checking out if you're interested in being vaccinated there's a computer program that was written that helps pair people that are interested in being vaccinated with unused uh vaccines because once you open once you start using a vial you have to use it or else it has to be disposed of by the end of the day so in an effort not to waste any of the vaccine, if someone misses their appointment, you know, because maybe they've changed their mind or life happens. Sometimes something else comes up, like, a, you know, maybe you get in a car accident or if a relative needed something, you know, and you have to go. So they miss their appointment. It can pair up somebody who is maybe not eligible currently based on their state's requirements. So if they're not vaccinating 16 plus currently, you, they will, if you're in the, that geographic region where the place has an, uh, an unused vaccine, they'll contact you and say, Hey, we have a shot. Do you want a shot before the end of the day? Can you be here in an hour or something? So it's high 
Dr. B, H I D R B.com. So you can register and see if it's in your area. And if not, you can also look at local pharmacies, like not your Walgreens and your CVSs, but like your more mom and pop regional pharmacies because they also have their own uh, wait lists that they have. So that's actually how Dan was able to get vaccinated was by a wait list from a local pharmacy. So um, if you're interested in doing that, you might be able to get vaccinated ahead of your. Uh, you know, age group or medical group, et cetera, just because occasionally things happen and people have to miss their appointments. So worth checking out. Yeah, definitely. I think I'm actually, I will check that out uh, because it is, it has been like hard to kind of like figure out like where to go and what's the best place to, to try to like book an appointment or like, you know, I did hear that I've had a few friends that have able to, been able to kind of like, you know, check in with a pharmacy and be like, oh yeah, like so-and-so missed their appointment. You know, if you come here before five o'clock, you know, you, you, you could have the vaccine. So, um, but you know, that, that, that can all kind of be like, you know, daunting and you get so caught up in your life. It's hard to like, keep like, uh, keep, keep going at it. So I think uh, a resource like that is going to be super useful, uh, definitely to someone like me. So I think I, I will definitely check that out. And I encourage everyone to, to, to just kind of like get as much information as you can out there and make the decision that is right for you. Um, so with, with all that being said, um, that that does wrap up our show for today. It was super uh, great to have both James and Mara here with me to talk about these great science news topics. Um, Mara, let's go over to you. If the, if the good people watching want to talk to you more about nuclear fission, uh, where can they find you online? Um, I lurk on Twitter at that Mara. Um, I still don't understand Instagram, but I'm mm -hmm. at that Mara LA because someone else decided to be that Mara. I don't know who she is, but she's not me. Um, mm -hmm. And I occasionally lurk over on uh, all things related to Dan Merle and the movie trivia Schmodown. But uh, my biggest takeaway, please consider doing something nice for someone else today. You have no idea what someone else is going through. And that can be a huge thing for somebody when they're going through something really bad. So spread kindness. Yes, definitely. Uh, and thank you so much. James, uh, the good people watching, I know we didn't really talk about any plant stories uh, today, but if anyone wants to get some advice on plants, I know Mara was talking about some succulents earlier uh, before we went live. Where can they find you online? While Mara is lurking, I'll be creeping over on Instagram at Terrell James Maple and on Twitter uh, below right here, James Maple Actor. And um, you can also catch me on uh, After Buzz TV and Black Hollywood Live as a writer there as well. So look out for articles from me uh, weekly. Awesome. Great. Yeah, guys, definitely go support James. Go support Mara. Go support Dan Merle. And also, please come support me. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram at BrandonHanna07. If you're already watching, you're already on my YouTube channel. But please, guys, hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't done so already. It's, just, it's really great to just kind of have you, have you all here with us and talk about science on a weekly basis. I have a lot of fun doing it, even if I do stumble over my own words and say, where are you at, instead of I where you're at. Such a gift worthy thing. Please someone make that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just clip it out. Uh, yeah, I think I think I see BCD in the chat. He's already on it. I feel like that he yeah. wants it on a t-shirt. I could just tell, I could just tell maybe, maybe one day, but uh, not today. But as far as today <laughs> goes, uh, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know how I was going to make that transition, but you know, I'm going to say the same thing that I always do every week. And that is thank you for taking time out of your day for this moment of science.